Hey everyone, and welcome to our new show, The Paleo Post Podcast. On this show, Genevieve and I will review some of the most important, new, and exciting topics relating to paleoanthropology and anthropology. Each week, we'll be going on air to help teach and educate science as it is being done. So get ready because your weekly paleo post is incoming. Woohoo! <laughs> now we're here again. I know, I know. Episode two. <laughs> So it, honestly, it's like the most fun 30 minutes of my week. I love doing this. So, Aww, and I should introduce, so <laughs> I know, right? Well, it's like, literally we get to sit here talking about our favorite topics. So I should probably <laughs> introduce myself though. I'm Genevieve. I'm a paleoanthropologist and rock art researcher. Mr. Seth. Of course, I am Seth, the founder and science communicator, World of Paleoanthropology. I know we're still trying to figure out this formatting and everything. I'm looking at our little script here and I'm being cued at the same time. We'll get it. We'll get it, everyone. Uh, but, you know, we're here. We're here to spread some paleoanthropology joy in Heck July. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, you know, why don't we start out with a story that you wanted to tell out of yeah. Oregon? Yes, absolutely. Well, and I guess see, even before we start, I think the fact that we're doing this in July is actually important because this Very is like good point. Yeah. field work season right now. So a lot of my colleagues, a lot of our colleagues are out in the field right now, as we're joking about making new news. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Um, right. So this is almost in a way often the quiet time for announcements because people aren't technically around. Um, they're out in the field doing stuff. But we do have one story that came out this last week. And then we have a couple stories that kind of came out within the last several weeks. So still fresh um, and totally Absolutely. worth talking about. But the Oregon story seems like a great place to start because it 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 continues to fit into the theme of everything is older than we thought it was. Um, and this is a great example from uh, Rimrock Draw is a rock shelter in Oregon. I got my notes to make sure we get this right. It is people were living there about 18,000 years ago. So, of course, again, far predating the typical traditional eight, 9,000 year dates for people coming over. Personally, I think it's much older. Um, but, you know, this is a, a really important part of that new debate that's going on, right? And trying to answer these questions. Absolutely. And I think, you know, for those of you who may be thinking and wondering, uh, let's just say this now, it was not Clovis first. Can we just nope. uh, bury that right now? Uh, not Clovis first. We'll give it a little nice funeral. We'll tuck it in. <laughs> May it rest in peace. <laughs> Seriously, what uh, what were the dates for the Clovis people? I'm not, I'm uh, a little off on that. Yeah, so, I mean, I think roughly the idea was that Clovis started somewhere around 9,000 years ago. And so the, the argument traditionally was that it wasn't until the ice sheets melted and everything receded and, you know, that then people came over to the Americas for the very first time um so now though i mean it's so weird to me though because it's like beringia was a huge piece of land like like literally when the ocean levels were lower because they were lower during the ice age because all the water was locked mm, up right. in the ice and so i mean literally we have like we we have Eurasia, like it's one massive <laughs> continent yeah. the, the entire northern hemisphere is one huge piece of land so of course people are going to be moving all over that piece of land right they probably came in they went out they went back they went up they went down like you know what i mean like people went to australia I'm sure people went the other way too so it's like I think it's been more about as with so many things like our own limits of our imagination our own limiting beliefs maybe as to what we think was possible and now though we have so many great tools at our disposal technically speaking that we're we're now able to get it the the real dates rather than us just sort of taking a guess or maybe being hampered by old ways of thinking so that's what i liked so much about the site was not just the eighteen thousand year dates or the fact that there was camels hanging around there um because there's <laughs> right? evidence of camel teeth i know it always makes me giggle i think they're furry camels too if i remember correctly like they're like I, I believe so yeah right oh my gosh and i just love that <laughs> um and so uh but the big thing is the technology that they used and this is again where 
archaeology ain't just your trowel and brush anymore like this is a whole new world we're in so at this site they used a whole bunch of really cool dating technology to confirm this so i mean these are really solid dates um number one they were able to date a layer of volcanic ash that had landed in the site um because this is a rock shelter so a rock shelter is just like an overhang it's not a deep cave and they lived underneath the overhang like protected them from the elements the sites in oregon so mount saint helens is near there and Mount St. Mm. Helens erupted around 15,000 years ago, and that left a layer of ash in the site. What uh, people may not know is that every volcano has a unique chemical signature, and every I eruption has a unique chemical signature. So even Mount St. Helens doesn't erupt exactly the same way every time. There's slightly different minerals and chemical signatures in the ash from a particular eruption, so they can date oh. it. Isn't that neat? So that's how they know. Uh, yeah, I had no idea. Yeah, so the eruption happened, laid down ash. The tools and bones they found were below it. So they're older than the 15,000. So that was the first clue that Clovis was not going to work here. And that was the first thing they found. <laughs> then what they were able to do was, um, like I said, they had, um, they did several things, super cool. Um, they found these really neat, orange agate scrapers so scrapers with bling if you will i always like that when it's pretty rock they're using pretty rocks they were right. able to find bison blood residue on the scrapers so they were able to connect the animal kills to the tools directly so that's great so now we've got not just guessing well you know again did the bison just fall down and die no it was killed we have the evidence of them scraping it and doing things with it then they were able to directly date the enamel of the teeth to an exact date of 8250 years ago isn't that cool yeah that's so insane. blood residue volcanic dating and direct enamel dating um lands those people living there 18,000 years ago at least they said there's actually deeper layers in the site they haven't dug yet um and oh, then wow. Isn't that cool? And then final yeah. piece, which I think is so important, is the local First Nations. Um, this mm -hmm. happens up. This happens up in Canada a lot too, where I mean they have amazing oral traditions up here that are like right, right, so old. And um, you know, we'll find the we'll find something. You know, like up here we found a fourteen thousand year old village a while ago, and the First Nations is like, yeah, we know. We told you about <laughs> it. We have stories. Um, same thing here. The local yeah. First Nations have these really cool oral traditions of the geological events described in the layers. So That's like insane. the eruptions and even cooler, they have this really neat story about the giant animal monsters, which would be like the big camels and bison probably. Isn't that neat? <laughs> so all that, that idea so cool. of, yeah megafauna because megafauna is huge so yeah like so they actually have all these amazing stories which match the hard dates so we also have the oral traditions confirming which just blows my mind so that was where that story on so many levels <laughs> was really cool and you know it really just again like you said pushes the dates back on everything that we knew about the peopling of the americas and like in our last episode we were talking about the giant sloth and mm -hmm. people with pendants from their bones in South America over yeah. what, 20,000 years ago? Dude, no, no, that was like 27,000. Yeah, 27,000, almost 30,000 right? years ago. Yeah. Uh, so lot, there's a lot of to uncover in the Americas oh, that we and, have yet to do. And, and so much, yes, yeah, so much has not been done. Um, super fun, I, not completely confirmed yet, but there is a high chance I'm going down to Brazil in October oh, yay. to go look at some That'd rock awesome. shelters in that province. That would be amazing. You'd have I'd to take so us with excited. you. Oh, seriously. <laughs> oh, well, absolutely. We'll have to do in the field. It'd be so cool. Um, yes. So right away, I was like, yes, please. That would be amazing. So I'm so excited <laughs> to have a chance to go see some of those weirdly old i'm using air quotes for people who can't see me because weirdly old sites <laughs> <laughs> okay so there's our oregon story you had a good one too which i love this story yeah too. so the next story that we're going to talk about is something that came out a few weeks ago i still i think it was still this it was in june june 26 yeah. um a paper came out published by a friend of world of paleoanthropology dr brianna pobener who is Yay, we the, love brianna we do we really do uh, she is the Human Origins Outreach Coordinator, I think is yep. her title, for the Smithsonian. 
Yeah. Uh, so she is does a lot for public outreach. Some of you guys may have heard of her, heard one of her lectures or something. Well, so she came out with a paper based on something that she specializes in, which is a, which is cut marks made by hominins using stone tools or other objects. And specifically what we're talking about is cut marks in bone, obviously in prey items or other animals that we're butchering for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Now, what was found in Kubifora that dates to about 1.6 million years old was a partial tibia. And this partial tibia that they've identified has what Brianna thinks, and being an expert in this, most people agree with her, mm -hmm. are cut marks or marks made by some sort of stone tool. Now, there's a few reasons why this is very interesting. The first one is it's made on a hominin tibia. So mm -hmm. that is a little odd, um, especially for, I mean, we've known obviously hominins are can be cannibals. We see it in our modern culture. Um, it's usually only for dire reasons. Hopefully, that's the only reason. Uh, we know it was present in Neanderthals, but we don't know why exactly. But it was probably more prevalent in the populations we at least see than in our population. But going back 1.6 or 1.45 million years, there are four species present at Kubifora. That's so cool. That is Paranthropus boisei, Homo habilis, Homo rudolfensis, and Homo erectus. Crazy. So, right? So there are two different sides we have to look at. We have to look at one, who does this tibia belong to? Yeah. Is tibia means shin bone, by the way. Right. Shin bone. Of course. Yes. I should have started with that. Um, so who does this leg bone belong to? Is it obviously it's one of those four species, but which is it? Mm -hmm. And then who did the cutting? Was it the same species that the tibia belonged to? Because that would be cannibalism. If it was not the same species, it's not technically cannibalism, yes. but it's still one hominin butchering another, which well, I somebody, actually think. Well, somebody was <laughs> nibbling on their neighbor. That was how I described right? it to my son. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's funny. Um, I actually think it's more interesting if it's not cannibalism, because one hominin either finding one another species and preying upon them or actually hunting them, yep. it's more interesting in my mind than cannibalism, which we already see present in cultures we know. Yep. We don't really know or have evidence of hominins hunting other hominins for food. Yeah, see, so, that's almost more disturbing, isn't it? Like, it almost has it a is. weird vibe. Do you know what it made me think of? I just, I'll say it super fast, but it's just, it made me think of it right away when I've taught, like, 200 level, the lab part of biological anthropology quite a few times. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we cover in that, because it's kind of an overview class, so they get a chance to do different parts of bioanth. And um, one of the things we do is the primate weeks. We have like a primate block and we show a video of chimps hunting a colobus monkey mm -hmm. and I eating it alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And every time there's those students, you could just see that like their vision of like, the nature <laughs> as this colobus monkey still alive i have to admit I, I sit there and watch the students not the the video because it, it's it's mind blowing or it's like definitely like eye-opening to be like yeah wait nature's not always nice like <laughs> right like nature like, doesn't even make sense no hunting's mean sometimes right like yes, like like absolutely. we kill things first but a lot of creatures don't so what you're saying that idea of like a group of homo habilis maybe purposely setting out to hunt a paranthropus has a weird vibe <laughs> yeah and that's exactly what i get from it is like yeah, yeah cannibalism you know it's kind of creepy but we've kind of culturally gotten over it a little bit it's in tv yeah. shows it's in pop culture these are a donner party situation <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> now if we were still alive with the neanderthals and they were yeah. hunting us we might think about it a little differently right so this idea and also let me add just to give a little more evidence so yeah. mostly old awan tools were found and very few few Acheulean hand axes so mm. that kind of rules out homo erectus a little bit from the area not completely mm -hmm. because we do see Acheulean hand axes there 
But we know, of course, all the one tools are made constantly by homo habilis. We're starting to think maybe Boise I could have. That's so We're cool. starting to think that. That's yeah. a whole different story, though. Yeah, yeah. Um, can't go there yet. But what yeah, I think, can't go there. Yeah. The big thing, too, is that the I was looking at where Brianna was describing the marks mm -hmm. on the bone. And right, those are right. not so because we should point out for listeners who may not know that. So there's cannibalism for dietary reasons. And then there's also cannibalism aka ritual defleshing right right which is more like so ritual defleshing would be that there are some cultures um in more recent history or even in like late paleolithic early neolithic um i think of the natufian in the levantine area for instance mm -hmm. um that uh those folks scraped the skin and everything muscles off of their dead and then plastered them and did things with them and actually kept them in the house right so they're mm -hmm. they may or may not have eaten it but they were defleshing but you cut in different places then if right. you're trying Depending to make a on... steak <laughs> you, if you want <laughs> right. a steak there's different cut points and i believe from what i saw in brianna's article that the, the cut points were if you wished to have a nice barbecue so i'm being yes, sarcastic that but, is yeah. Of course, of course. <laughs> that is a very good point, though, that you brought that up, yeah. because there actually is a skull that was found, uh, I'm trying to remember the exact Ooh. details, that has uh, two, let me see here. There is a skull that has, I believe, under the eyes pockets uh cut marks oh so and maybe more dates, scraping it they're not 100 percent sure and it dates to around the same or it doesn't date around the same time i don't know what i'm talking about but it shows the same type of marks Ooh, and okay. brianna was comparing them and she came to the conclusions that she needs to actually revisit them <laughs> um quote you can make some pretty amazing discoveries by going back into museum collections and taking a second look at fossils. Mm -hmm. Not everyone sees everything the first time around. It is a community of scientists coming in with different qu questions and techniques to keep expanding our knowledge of the world. And she said this as a last little tidbit about this, because this leg bone, this tibia, mm -hmm. she found in a drawer in the, in the National Museum there. Yep. It was just sitting in a drawer with these cut marks. No one had seen them. No one thought that this shin bone, this leg bone was particularly important beyond it being a hominin fossil. But by going back and examining things further, which I think all of us need to do with our finds and Absolutely. with future finds, we can discover and learn new things that we haven't seen. So while we may not have been barbecuing all of our ancestors. It seems <laughs> it did occur maybe here and there. Yeah. So just keep that in mind. <laughs> I know, right? So yeah, next time you're like, my, what a lovely tibia you have there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I, think, I think we get sort of, because we spend our time thinking about these things, we, we come up with some pretty good, there's some great jokes you can make for sure. Um, no, exactly <laughs> what you said was what I was sort of thinking, like, what's the takeaway from the story other than the fact it's cool and intriguing and yeah, slightly chilling the concept of being hunted by our hominid yeah. cousins um yeah but also is exactly what you said i mean it, we've talked about this before you don't find what you're not looking for and exactly. we see that in rock art as well we see that like this entire field because it started the work started over 100 years ago i mean there are so many sites where they pull things out and they never expected to find cut marks so they didn't look for them or, you know, they weren't using microscopes yet, or like, especially with the early stuff. Right. And so there, I guarantee you, are treasure troves sitting all over the world right now in collections um, that are just waiting for somebody like Brianna to re-examine them, right? Or, I mean, when it Absolutely. comes to art as well, I mean, the story in South Africa after Blombos is that they went back and started looking at some of the collections from other neighboring mm -hmm. sites to Blombos in South Africa, and they found engraved marks non-figurative right. stuff that's not really you know these are not things that are related to hunting or anything but like so there's a lot out there just waiting to be found and i and i think that really is where the story is. goes yeah and you know what i think the next story that you have is a perfect example of the fact that there is still 
more defined, even in things that we thought, I mean, we found practically all of it. So right? why don't you lead on with the next story? Yeah, well, I think this was this was sort of a, a prelim story. So this was a team in Alicante in Spain, and they were wanting to announce that they'd made some really neat prelim discoveries using a drone as their tool. So Alicante, there's a couple of regions like this in Spain, have these big, really deep canyons. And so it's very, very hard work to physically go around and survey. Um, and, and so this is where instead they used a drone to go and peek into these sort of shallow rock shelters, which are found sometimes up really high cliff lines. Um, this past year, I actually met a couple of archeologists who were also rock climbers who specifically go to these regions in Spain with the really high canyons and they get to have the fun of rock climbing and doing rock art at the same time. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, but the crazy thing is, um, so, in some cases, they think ancient people were going into these very difficult to get to places um, that they would have also had to use ropes for one thing, because they're literally mm. on the side of these massive cliffs. Yeah. Um, and also one of my colleagues um, who did his dissertation looking at this kind of art, because this is actually Neolithic. This is art from just after the end of the Ice Age. And um, they were, some of the folks in this area were quite, they, they seem to have been really into collecting honey. And so it's thought that collecting honey may have been the motivation to go into some of these sites initially. Mm, um, okay. And then also maybe ritual sites and things like that, but that honey, because that, there's lots of these little bees that make like nests and stuff in that area. So kind of a neat oh. idea. Yeah. yeah that's and so I think they're now going back. So they've, but they found two caves in particular with some absolutely beautiful paintings in them which they would have as they said it would have taken days to trek around and try and look for those and they found it in a few hours using the drone because the drone can <laughs> basically point in look at it see if there's anything there or not and then it you know they're able to see in real time what the drone seeing is amazing and, and so I think this is a wonderful case of technology um I think we've talked before about the fact that another area that desperately needs more technology is under the ocean because of course, Absolutely. during the last ice age, the water levels were like, they were a hundred meters lower in some places, uh, which is really low. And, and I mean, yeah. we have <laughs> Cosquet off the coast of uh, Marseille in France, and that particular site, I mean, the entrance now is really deep underwater, um, but what else is there? And so this idea of looking in these places that are quote unquote, un inaccessible, or very difficult to access is, we're now developing tools that are allowing us to do this and to do it efficiently, right, to do right. it more quickly, or allowing us to go in places that we couldn't really go before because maybe there are other cascades sitting along coastlines right. just waiting to be found, um, or in the Americas too. I mean, half the sites are probably underwater now because yeah. the water levels mm -hmm. rose. Uh, but if you can get the same conditions like Cascade, where there's like air trapped into the cave and things like that. Yeah you could still have rock art sitting under the water. Absolutely. In almost pristine Amazing. condition. Waiting to be found. That's insane. Isn't that neat? And then same with like all these deep canyons where, um, you know, this, that part of Spain is so interesting because it's one of the only places where we have the art has continuity from the Paleolithic. So the end of the ice age, a lot of places it just stops. In these cases, they keep making art, but it changes with the new culture and the new priorities and the new lifestyle. So um, like I said, one of my colleagues, George Nash, has done some really neat work on that area as well. And it, there's a hardly, hardly touched. So if anybody's looking for future work, like nobody's hardly doing this time period. And yet it's probably a really interesting one to help understand what's going on with that transition from the Paleolithic to the modern, you know, agricultural, you know, the change, the change, that big inflection point in humanity. So, so much still waiting to be found and yay technology that's helping us get there. Absolutely. You know, there's just so much that we have figured out and discovered simply because we have developed new ways of analyzing the yeah. data yeah. or searching for new discoveries. Thanks to technologies. Like you said, they use drones. Yeah. I mean, were they searching for cave art, do you know? Or were they just flying a yeah. drone and they found it? No, no, these these are actual rock art researchers. Sorry, I should have okay. clarified that. Yeah, so no, this was <laughs> them saying, how can we be more efficient? Because there's hundreds of caves. 
But if you have right. to like rope up and like, you know, rappel down or climb up to every single one, you're not going to be able to cover much ground, even in a big field season, right? So this way they can be so much more efficient. Um, the other thing with drones that I think would be very intriguing to do as well is that I have a thermal drone. Cave entrances mm. have a very yeah. distinct temperature range. And so this is something I want to go play with is that if you've got either really cold or really hot, the cave entrance has air that's a very specific temperature and in the right, right conditions we should be able to actually identify cave entrances even if it's not visible to the naked eye using thermal drones so again even in areas like spain where there's been lots of work done i bet you there's lots of other cool sites just waiting to be yeah, found i i would not take the bet against you no nope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that you know that that's one of the things that I just love so much about this field and this science is that it truly never ends. No, you know, there's just yeah. so much out there. And it's just a delight. Like everything we find, it's not even like, I, I feel sorry for fields where it's like, we have made this tiny little incremental improvement <laughs> here. It's like literally in any, if the matter of like, under five years, you know, the age of humanity has jumped from 200,000 to 300,000. Like, you know, we've got new species like Denisovids. We didn't even know we had Denisovids. Like, you know, all yeah. these crazy things are happening and it's happening so fast. It's such a fun field, but you also really, I think we have to be very open-minded and very humble in the fact that the theories we think we have could totally be proved wrong tomorrow. A hundred percent. We need to be okay with that and then go and move into this new territory with you know scientific rigor for sure but also with an open mind one million percent i will say actually <laughs> as and, i push my know, glasses I... up in a very <laughs> nerdy way <laughs> right but you know i think with those words on just keeping that in mind and knowing yeah. you know i have a i like to say there's always more to learn like that's my little mm -hmm. saying that i slap on everything and i think besides this field is just true in life and i think that's a great way for us to end this episode episode two of the paleo post podcast which everyone listening i know some of you were well i guess if you were listening to it you didn't have an issue uh but for some of you it was only on apple podcast for the first episode uh that has been rectified and has been shared and this episode will also be available on podbean which will be distributed everywhere as well Yay. so well, we we're expanding every, all of our fellow paleo enthusiasts to have access if they wish uh -huh. yes exactly so we we're working on it and we'll have that ready for everyone yes. and until then that's a goodbye from me We'll see you next week with more fun stories. <laughs> Absolutely. See you next time, everyone.